Good evening and a warm welcome to all the dignitaries present here. Myself, Rupsha from ClearNet, assigned as a session assistant to ensure a seamless experience. ClearNet stands as India's most relied upon digital platform, offering a multitude of enriching services exclusively for doctors. It is with great pride that ClearNet is the digital partner of this event organized by National Neonatology Forum. And the topic of today's session is NOEL Education and Learning Session 26. So let's begin today's session, for which I would like to hand over this session to Dr. Nadini Khan, sir, over to you, sir. Please proceed with your talk. Thank you, Clenet team, for the uh, creating the platform. And NNF, uh, thank you, NNF. With this, uh, we know that this session is a weekly session of uh, NNF for fellow trainees, uh, training session, online training session. For today's session, we got a case from uh, Mehta Children Hospital, Chennai. And to present that, NNF trainee from Mehta Children Hospital, Dr. Aniruddh is here. I'm inviting him to uh, start the presentation and we are privileged to get to moderate and uh, be a faculty. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Sara Velur, she is a genetist and metabolic specialist and consultant in the Rainbow Children Hospital. I welcome Dr. Sara to be faculty here and lead the discussion further. And in this case presentation format, I request uh, both Dr. Sara and I will be here. So. Uh, during the presentation, it is not like a didactic PowerPoint presentation teaching. In throughout the case presentation, any point of time, if we need to uh, in, uh, discuss some points, to highlight some points or to give inputs, it is most welcome. And in the meantime, probably we can generate some questions we can ask to the audience delegates who are our NNF trainees available. They can answer through the chat box. So with this, I will invite Dr. Anirudh to start the session. The presentation already we are late by 10 to 12 minutes so if we can start the session we can finish in the time uh, anirudh uh, can you uh, share your ppt powerpoint presentation yes sir Able to see my screen, sir. It is visible, sir. Perfectly. Yeah. Visible. yeah. Audible, sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Audible. Yes, audible. Please go ahead. No problem. Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so this is Dr. Anirudh. So uh, uh, I would like to thank our HOD ma'am, Dr. Lakshmi ma'am, for giving this opportunity, and also NNF of uh, uh, Dr. Nalini Kansar for uh, giving me this platform to present this case. So uh, here I am going to present uh, a case that we recently encountered within our NICU. So uh, this is a G2P1, a 27-year-old uh, mother who conceived by normal uh, spontaneous conception uh, third degree consanguineous marriage. Uh, the mother had no significant antenatal risk factors. The antenatal scans and also Dopplers were normal. The first child is four years old, alive and also healthy now. Uh, coming to the baby details, so the mother delivered a late preterm 36 old uh, male baby born at 7.51 am on 19.524. Birth weight was 2.5 kgs. Appropriate for gestation, cried after birth. Afghar scores were good. Uh, delivered by emergency section because the mother had labor pains and because there was a prior, prior section, they had to take with it and it was delivered at an outside hospital. So the baby was breastfed at two hours of life. Baby passed urine and meconium within 24 hours. There was no significant neonatal illness. The baby was discharged from the hospital on the fourth day of life on direct breastfeeds. Birth vaccines were given. From day four to day 11 of the life, the mother, yeah. baby was only on the direct wow. breastfeeds with the decreased activity and also poor feed intake, passing urine and also slight yellow stools once or twice, uh, once uh, or uh, once in a day or in two days. 
So coming to the feeding history, the baby was exclusively breastfed. Baby was not on any pre-lactal feeds. There were uh, no uh, bad child rearing practices. Mother says that the baby was not demanding feeds with poor suck and also cry upwards. The frequency of the feeds used to be two to four hours once. The baby used to feed uh, like 10 minutes each time from both the breasts. The urine frequency was around four to six times. The baby was passing stools uh, pigmented once uh, a day or in a two. So on day 12 of the life, the uh, baby was taken to a local pediatrician in view of uh, decreased activity where the pediatrician advised them formula feeds. So the baby was on formula feeds along with the direct breast feeds. And Dr. Anirudh, Dr. Anirudh yes, I just sir. want to stop it here because this is going a simple case presentation which we can see in day-to-day -day life. It yes. can happen to any baby. Yes, and the sir. first two weeks of life, feeding difficulty is a very, very common scenario. Yes, so, if, if it comes to you as a pediatrician, how will assess the milk is sufficient or not, the feeding process is sufficient or not, adequate or effective or not, and the feeding amount is sufficient or not? These questions I will ask before going to some of the your pediatrician colleagues from outside started uh, formula feeding. So, before formula feeding, we have to ask three basic questions Is the baby active, latching proper? Is the effectively the latching happening? Is the milk enough milk is there on the feeding? Total feeding is effective. It is going well or not? These are the few questions we have to ask. How will assess? What questions you will ask? So you will assess because we have not seen the baby last twelve days came to your OPD with this complaint. But what are the relevant histories we will ask so that we will get exactly what may be the reason? Sir, uh, we'll ask questions like uh, how many times a baby is uh, passing urine per day. So ideally, baby should pass uh, at least six times of urine per day. Activity should be good. And uh, when breastfeeding, when mother is uh, feeding on one side breast, the, there should be let down reflex from the opposite side as well. Uh, so, uh, there should be a good latching uh, by the baby as well. So you know, do you know any score is there for latching, anything for feeding technique? Is going well or not? Yes, sir. There is a latch score. Mm -hmm. So, do you know the components of this last score? No, no, sir. Okay. So, how to assess the feeding is adequate or not? One is feeding process. Or the amount of feeding is going well or not? One, you told urine output. And are there any, any, anything you can ask exactly? Or you can do uh, any calculation, any measurement, any examination, so that you can know exactly, okay, the feeding is going well or not? So there should be let down reflex from the opposite breast when the mother is feeding on one side, sir. That is Absolutely. a sign that the baby is uh, getting adequate amount of milk. Absolutely. What is a definitive way to know actually? The feeding each time actually, the feeding is happening, uh, but each time. But actually the baby is not growing or a baby is lethargic, baby some disease, not, not taking milk. But particularly in front of you ask the feeding, how to know this feeding is going well. This feeding exactly, this feeding, baby is getting... The baby Enough is separating the feeds without any vomiting or... Uh... So, one we will got an answer actually got from the del, uh, the trainees or attending probably. So, we got an answer that weight gain. So, if 12 days already over, so what should the weight gain or weight loss pattern since birth weight? Ideally, a term, baby should, term baby should lose weight in the first seven days and should regain its uh, birth weight by the day seven or day ten of life, sir. So that is ideal weight gain pattern. So uh, this baby did not... Uh, loss will be 3 to 5 days. Static yes. will be 7 days. 7 to 10 days, we should get the full yes. amount of... Uh, we should get at least uh, baby's weight gain. So yes. you have to, have to ask that question later in the history. That's the weight gain pattern. And the Im immediately you want to assess once the milk is adequate or not, the baby is getting or not. You can check the pre and post feeding weight also for the baby. Yes, sir. No. A 12 days old baby... In front of you, you just can check the weight and ask for feeding and check objectively. You want to know how much feeding has gone into the baby. So because yes. here the question comes in the case when you are take, talking 12 days, somebody assist and asking a formula feeding. I will say that, okay, formula feeding suggested means somebody has assessed properly. It may be the baby factor or it may be maternal illness factor or the feeding latching factor, inadequate milk assessment. These all things you have to see before going to the formula feeding. So this basic history. Urine, passing motion, latching well, sucking well, baby's weight gain pattern, and the baby's current 
we are things also you can ask is today's feeding exactly this particular feeding is happening well or not okay yes sir okay please proceed then no problem so on day 16 of the live baby had uh, abdominal distension with uh, poor activity and baby also had three episodes of non bilious vomitings there was no history of seizures so baby they so they took uh, the baby to the same hospital so baby was referred from there to our hospital for the further management so on examination in our nicu baby was lethargic baby was floppy with minimal movements on uh, stimulation there was pallor there was it, from head to toe examination baby's a, uh, anterior fontanel was open uh, baby had pallor baby had icterus there was no cyanosis no edema there was abdominal distension on examination um, vitals were heart rate around 138 beats per minute respiratory rate was 48 cycles per minute saturating around 96% on room air capillary refilling time was 3 seconds non invasive blood pressure was 50 to systolic by 40 mm of mercury in diastolic in, measured in the left leg and temperature was 36 degree centigrade and the sugar at presentation was 82 mg per deciliter so systemic examination uh, cardiovascular system first and second heart sounds were heard no murmurs present a respiratory system bilateral air entry is present normal vesicular uh, breath sounds were heard central nervous system baby is floppy cry and tone uh, that cry and activity is poor anterior fontanel was at level per abdomen abdomen examination the abdomen appears to be distended but it was soft liver was palpable 4 cm below the costal margin uh, in the uh, subcostal margin in the uh, uh, mid clavicular line spleen was not palpable so after the history and also the examination uh, the uh, differential diagnosis would go in ways of anemia with cholestasis under evaluation uh, differential diagnosis include the late onset sepsis including well, meningitis common protein allergy viral enterocolitis inborn errors of metabolism congenital infections to rule out touch so course in the hospital so the baby was admitted in the nicu in our hospital kept on uh, nail per oral iv fluids were started with a jr of about 6 mg per kg per minute and investigations were sent and started on empirical antibiotics so we initially did the sepsis workup so the crp was around 16 platelet was 1.32 the wbc was around 7000 with predominant c of lymphocytes uh, so we further yeah. did the second tier test where we did the csf examination which was normal the touch panel was also sent the meningo encephalitis panel was also sent which was negative so we had to do this since baby had hepatomegaly we did a liver function test where we saw a total bilirubin of 11.28 with a conjugated fraction of 9.21 which is more than 20% of the total and also indirect bilirubin of about 2.2 mg per dl the sgot sgpt were a normal limit and alp of about 650 so pt aptt inr uh, were deranged uh, the baby's albumin levels were normal uh, so in view of deranged uh, coagulation parameters baby was given one unit of fresh frozen plasma also the hb was around 6.8 for which baby received one unit of the packet red blood cells so baby had encephalopathy so baby uh, so we uh, also had did the serum electrolytes which showed a serum sodium levels of around 125 milli coulombs so we continued the uh, maintenance uh, dns maintenance fluids we got a neurosonogram done which showed diffuse cerebral edema baby had no seizures no increase in head circumference and the anterior circumference uh, sorry head circumference was monitored which showed no increase and the af was not bulging so we repeated the serum sodium levels after uh, two days uh, which was around 136 we also had so anirudh 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 before going to im before going to im presentation i last few of the clues here how normally without knowing the diagnosis how we should proceed as a neonatologist or pediatrician in the first two weeks a baby presenting with the non bilious vomiting so what will be my differential diagnosis for this baby only one complaint that is non bilious vomiting that's a symptom uh this this will come to science again later but a symptom of non bilious vomiting what do you think of in first one or two weeks non bilious vomiting in first two two weeks of life sir one or two weeks because this baby is by 12 symptomatic on the first one or two weeks only so in the first one or two weeks of baby the with baby is non bilious vomiting what do you think of what are the differential diagnosis will come to our mind i would think of late onset sepsis sir mm -hmm. i would think of uh, some intestinal obstruction i would also which type of can you specific which type of so 
because uh, intestinal obstruction, which type will have a non bilious and which type will have a bilious vomiting? Uh, bilious vomiting, when it is proximal to the second part of uh, duodenum and there is an obstruction, it will be uh, non bilious. When it is distal to that, uh, there will be a bilious type of vomiting, sir. So you can say that if it, it will be a uh, duodenal atresia or it will be a malnutrition and it will yes, be sir. in comparison to if ileal atresia or regional atresias. So yes, that sir. one group of will be yes, dominantly non-bilious, other group will be dominantly bilious vomiting possible. Yes, sir. Any other disease possible? First two weeks? Common other disease anything allergy. possible? Common protein allergy. Common protein, very good. Then any other thing? Like, any other reason of gastroesophageal reflux also possible? Yes, sir. GER can also present with recurrent non-bilious vomiting. And like you are talking sepsis, we have to think of always when it comes to sepsis, uh, latent sepsis is a possibility. Then any mm -hmm. metabolic causes, do you think any of the metabolic causes can present? Yes, sir. Uh, inborn errors of metabolism can actually present with uh, vomitings. Uh, the galactosemia, for example, mm -hmm. tyrosinemia, mm -hmm. the other mm -hmm. uh, fatty acid oxygen defects can also present with uh, vomitings, failure to thrive. When it will present, typically. Sorry, sir. Because Infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, a baby. It usually presents when the baby will present the third, with vomiting. Because in the third week of life, sir, congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Causes you will investigate, it will come to a conclusion. But... Hello, sir, your uh, voice is breaking. Hello, 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 sir. So what I'm saying, if, can you narrow down your differentials if you're getting vomiting, baby? Poor feeding, lethargy, vomiting. Now you got a hepatomegaly. Yes, sir. So we can divide the baby into a sick or a well-thriving child. Okay. So when this, when baby is sick, we can uh, narrow down the diagnosis uh, and work up uh, based upon that. When the baby is well-thriving, we can go in another set of uh, diagnosis. Sir. When the baby is doing sick baby, we need to rule out the uh, infections. We need to rule out uh, sepsis and other infections. We need to rule out uh, the inward uh, errors of metabolism. Is the baby going into liver failure? Based on that, uh, we'll get this uh, uh, liver function test done. So we, we see the derangement of the coagulation profile. We look for the enzyme levels, SGOT, SGPT, and also GGT, etc. So for a well-thriving child with hepatomegaly, with uh, pale stools, uh, we will have to rule out the surgical causes of uh, jaundice or any obstruction that is actually causing uh, the E. coli stools in the baby. So accordingly, we'll have to proceed. Okay. So depending on the function, actually, which function affected? Is the transcendent is dominant, the cholestatic group is dominant, or synthetic function is dominantly impaired? Yes. In the liver evaluation, you can proceed further. So, yes. so like that, each organ, you got a clue. What I'm adding, actually, a baby lethargy, poor feeding, next to investigated hepatomegaly. Next, during examination, you saw babies and cephalopathic, dull lethargic, which initially started, now frank and cephalopathic. So the clues, you want only additional clues with that. So when we got lethargy, poor feeding, vomiting, hepatomegaly, and now encephalopathy. So you're combining these all things, now we can proceed. So when IM is a broad subject, IM is a big, uh, big thing. So there, if these clues will combine, probably we can narrow down our differentials and investigation can add on to the, the existing clinical information there with you, then add on investigations can help now. So can please proceed with IM, what, what you thought of what IM's possibilities and how you investigated, please proceed so that we'll learn from your experience. Yes.
So we got this uh, metabolic IEM uh, workup was done. So the initial ammonia was 200, lactate was 6.27, which is elevated. So we got a venous blood gas at admission, which showed a uh, metabolic acidosis picture. So we proceeded further. We, not, we wanted to rule out this anatomical causes, if at all present. So which was showing hepatomegaly with bubble wall thickening. So urine for reducing substances were sent, so which was actually negative. Uh, so the further investigations I'll tell further, sir. So at this point of time, I'm not telling all this uh, further uh, follow-up of yeah, fine, metabolic fine, 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 diagnosis. No yes, sir. Uh, so coming to nutrition, the baby was initially kept on uh, nilpar oral uh, since uh, we had uh, a suspicion of inborn error of metabolism. So then we started on minimal feeds on the third day of admission once the baby's sensorium improved. So baby tolerated feeds. Baby, so we limited the feeds to only 40 ml per kg per day. So until we sent a newborn uh, screening program, uh, screening test. So we were waiting for the test report. So we continued with 40 ml per kg per day feeds along with IV fluids till the reports have actually come. So we also got the referrals from the geneticist and also the pediatric neurologist uh, at the end of investigations per se. Uh, so this is the uh, table that is showing... Uh, the investigations that we actually performed. So on the day of admission, we got uh, uh, the initial uh, screening, so which included the complete bed count, so which was showing a hemoglobin of over around 9.8, PCV of 30.8, total counts with 7.1, platelet of 1.32. So we got uh, this uh, liver function test, so which was showing a total bilirubin of 11.48 with a direct fraction of around 9.21, which is more than 20% of the total uh, fraction, indirect uh, bilirubin of 2.27, and AST 64, ALT 28, and ALP 639, total protein was 6.9. A by G ratio was more than 1.5. Uh, so PT, APTT, and INR were deranged. PT 27, APTT 107. So we had to give one pint of fresh frozen plasma at this point of time. We also got this ammonia done, which is 200 lactate 6.27. CRP was 16.09. So we further did this uh, CSF analysis since the baby was also having empathy and also altered sensorium. So the total number of cells were two, predominantly lymphocytes, with the sugar being 49, parallel sugar was 56. The gram staining of the CSF was actually uh, showed no growth. So next day, we actually did this. So with this investigation, Dr. Anirudh, yes, with this sir. investigation, I yes. can interpret there is a hepatomegaly, the cholestatic yes, jaundice because the yes. alkaline phosphatase was a little higher, 635. Yes with uh, protein uh, 3.5, little synthetic function also must be deranged. And platelet, PT, APTT is deranged, so synthetic function of the liver deranged or a coagulopathy independently, I'm not sure. But if the platelets are, was platelets was okay with the, this point of time? Yes, the platelets were borderline low, sir. 1.32, borderline, huh? yeah. Then uh, this, uh, with these investigations, if hepatomegaly there, and there is derangement of liver function there, do, uh, do you get the opportunity to do a urine test, a routine urine test to ask any uh, few common metabolites? Did you get the opportunity to do the urine test? We did a day? complete urine examination, sir. So the pus cells were negative, epithelial uh -huh. were one or two. Um, uh, urine for reducing substances were negative, sir. <laughs> Hello, sir. Hello. Hello. Please continue. Yes. So we also further worked out since uh, we wanted to rule out the infections. So we got an ultrasound and also a MRI, like a neurosonogram done. So neurosonogram was showing a pattern of diffuse cerebral edema. So we wanted to suspect, we were suspecting torch infections as well. So we did the torch panel, which was... Uh, showed no uh, way the torch uh, organisms were not detected. Meningo encephalitis uh, panel was also done, so it's negative. So urine routine, already I told you. So we also worked up on the scrub and also uh, dengue, which is uh, common here. So that is also negative. 
so we repeated uh, so on day 4 of admit day 5 of admission the baby was looking very pale so we repeated the hemoglobin which was around 6.3 6.3 gram per deciliter so we had to give a unit of prbc transfusion at this point of time and on the same day the direct fraction total uh, bilirubin value actually came down to 4 but still the direct fraction is about 3.71 which is uh, more than about 20% of the total so we repeated following the initial uh, 120 sodium so subsequently it was around 130 and also 137 and bicarbonate also improved from uh, 15 to till about 19.6 so these were the investigations that we did so with time uh, the blood culture that we sent was also sterile the urine culture that we sent was also sterile we repeated an ammonia and also lactate further on the uh, day three of admission so ammonia came down to 119 and lactate came down to 1.79 to summarize uh, the case based upon the uh, clinical examination, the history, and also the lab findings. So we had this infectious screening panel, which was negative, other than the CRP, which was 16 initially. The CSF analysis was normal. Touch panel was negative. IM workup uh, was done. So initially, it showed a high ammonia, high lactate. So we did a newborn screening examination, which showed an elevated galactose level. So we finally planned with an MRI, so which was showing extensive uh, white matter hyper intensities uh, suggesting edema with the MR spectroscopy which is which was showing a galactic 12 peak so we also wanted to uh, get we also got an ophthalmology uh, examination uh, done which actually showed bilateral cataract so this was the neurosonogram reports and this was actually the ultrasound uh, reports uh, so neurosonogram was showing diffuse cerebral edema and also mild thickened corpus callosum. The ultrasound abdomen was showing hepatomegaly with peripotal hypoechogenicity, minimal free fluid in abdomen, SMV uh, anterior to SMA, diffuse bowel wall thickening. So we also got a routine 2D echo in this baby. So in order to see any signs of failure, so which was absolutely normal. PFO shunting left to right, IVC normal, collateral uh, normal biventricular function. So we further proceeded with the newborn uh, screening examination. So newborn screening examination showed a total galactose level of greater than 50 with the threshold or a cutoff being not more than 25 milligram per deciliter. So based on this, we further uh, proceeded by sending the TMS and also GCMS for this baby. So till then, the baby was continued at around uh, 40 ml per kg per day of the fee. <clears throat> so, Baby was on lactose free, uh, was started on lactose free diet. And after uh, we got this galactose levels uh, elevated, so we continued with the lactose free diet and uh, baby was started at liberal feeds. So we did this TMS and GCMS and also finally with the whole exome sequencing finally. So whole exome sequencing was showing pathogenic variants, uh, suggesting the classical uh, galactosemia. So, so to summarize, late preterm, third degree consanguineous marriage, cried after birth, good Abgar scores, no significant antenatal risk factors. So presenting on day 16 of life with failure to thrive, encephalopathy with abdominal distension, uh, and also jaundice. Clinical examination showing anemia, ectris, hepatomegaly, cholestasis, and also encephalopathy. Sepsis workup negative, torch viral panel negative, culture sterile, CSF was also sterile. Metabolic workup was done, which showed high lactate ammonia, high galactose, TMS, GCMS, and also whole exam sequencing suggesting galactosemia. So imaging was done initially to rule out this uh, anatomical or the obstructive causes or surgical causes of cholestasis. Uh, so that was ruled out. So NSG showing cerebral edema and also aftal showing cataract and also MRI which was showing uh, diffuse cerebral edema with the galactetal peak. So this was a case of uh, galactosemia. So coming to the discussion, cholestasis in infants who continue to have jaundice beyond two weeks of age, as well as those with hepatomegaly, pale stools or diarrhea, the serum bilirubin concentration should be obtained and a fractionated into direct and also indirect portions. So the cholestasis is caused by reduce of bile flow and it is clinically defined as direct bilirubin greater than 1 mg per dl if the total bilirubin is less than 5 mg per dl or greater than 20% of total bilirubin if the bilirubin levels total bilirubin is greater than 5 mg per dl. 
cholestasis is never physiological and it should always prompt immediate uh, evaluation to determine the specific uh, etiology so certain conditions are amenable to the medical or surgical interventions like uh, galactosemia where we have the lactose free diet for that tyrosinemia we have nutritionone cholidocal cyst uh, where we have surgical procedures for that bacterial and viral sepsis which uh, can be treated by antibiotics and also antivirals biliary atresia which again is a surgical uh, problem so all this so diagnosing and treating the child early can prevent the progression to the liver failure or development of serious extra hepatic manifestations so there are certain red flag signs for the neonatal cholestasis in a uh, uh, neonatal so in, we can get it through the maternal history so in a prenatal ultrasound abnormality we can diagnose the cholitocal cyst biliary atresia fibrosis and also gallstone intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy in mother should point towards progressive familial intrahepatic cholestasis and mitochondrial disease acute fatty liver, liver of pregnancy will rule out about long chain uh, hydroxyacetyl coa dehydrogenase uh, deficiency maternal infection during uh, pregnancy will point towards the congenital infections like torch so physical findings a colic stools can be seen in uh, sur surgical conditions like sludge cholidocal cyst and also biliary atresia palpable mass in right upper quadrant point towards cholidocal cyst heart murmur so which can be seen in monogenic syndromic uh, syndromes like allegily syndrome and also biliary atresia butterfly vertebra which can be seen in allegily ascites spontaneous perforation of bile duct dysmorphic faces again in allegilies gelbeger syndrome which is a peroxisomal disorder chromosomal abnormalities microcephaly which can be seen in torch infections posterior embryo toxin again in allegily chorioretinitis which can also be seen in the congenital infections so these are the baseline investigations uh, that has to be done in a child presenting with cholestasis. So the first tier, the second tier uh, investigations to be done to rule out the metabolic disorders, the septic workup, and also the other IEM panel, and also for alpha-1 antitrypsin, sweat chloride. Consultations uh, should be obtained from the ophthalmology to rule out cataract. From the genetics uh, to rule out the other conditions involved, so we get imaging done, ultrasound, HIDA scan uh, can be done, echo, chest x-ray and also ultrasound. So liver biopsy can be done in conjunction with the gastroenterologist, lip biopsy for hemochromatosis. So this is the protocol that uh, uh, we should follow for uh, evaluating a case of neonatal cholestasis. So first of all, we see if the baby is sick or baby is actually well. So if the baby is sick, we start with the prophylactic broad spectrum antimicrobial. We send for cultures, we send for urine examination. So uh, we also send for newborn screening uh, test uh, and also the torch panels, etc. So the IEM, uh, the TMS and GCMS uh, should be sent to rule out the fatty acid oxidation, mitochondrial leptopathies and urea cycle disorders. If the baby is in liver failure, we should uh, assess the severity of the liver failure. We see if the baby's uh, deranged coagulation profile, uh, albumin in the uh, baby and also hyperammonemia, hypoglycemia, ascites and also spinomegaly. So we should consider especially the conditions like hemochromatosis, HSV and also HLH. So when a baby is thriving well, so we see if the baby is having pigmented stools or pale stools. If the baby is having pigmented stools, we get an ultrasound and also gamma glutamyl transaminase done. So we need to rule out the, uh, if baby is having low GGT, so, uh, which can be seen in PFIC1 and 2, high GGT in the PFIC3 can be seen. Or Dr. Low... Andrew, did you do uh, GGT for your baby? Yes, sir, we did it, sir. GGT was normal only, sir. Okay. So, because I at least actually I was going to ask you because you went to the algorithm now, but the least uh, investigation list uh, I did not see that the ILP was there, transaminitis mm -hmm. enzymes were there. So, I thought the GGT would have been help us like, hepatosis. So, the cause or, uh, sir, uh, mm -hmm. I forgot to put that level. Sir. <laughs> yeah. Okay, proceed. No problem. So, pale stools, uh, we need to rule out uh, the uh, uh, biliary atresia. So, we get an ultrasound or a HIDA scan done. Biliary atresia, liver biopsy can be done. To be uh, the confirmatory is the paraoperative cholangiogram to rule out biliary atresia. If the USC is showing cyst at the porta hepatis or uh, cholidocal cyst, we need to do surgical management. So, treatable causes of neonatal cholestasis. So, anatomical biliary atresia, we get a hepatic photoenterostomy, cholidocal cyst, mucosectomy, and cholidocoenterostomy, spontaneous perforation of common bile duct, surgical drainage, inspissated bile, biliary tract irrigation, infections, antimicrobial, endocrine uh, like hypothyroid, we give hypothyroid replacement, hypopetrotism, we need to give 
thyroid hormone growth hormone and cortisol replacement genetic uh, diseases and inborn errors of metabolism like galactosemia we need to give a lifelong galactose free diet and tyrosinemia we give ntbc and hereditary fructose intolerance fructose or sucrose free diet so this is hey, uh, the anirudh you can ignore neonatal cholestasis because already we know the diagnosis for you yes, in yes, this yes. diagnosed baby of uh, galactosemia how for the will proceed for prognostication for the counseling and for the managing the baby you those yes. you can highlight yes sir so this is the uh, lee loyer pathway which is showing the galactose metabolism so galact uh, the dietary milk which predominantly contains lactose which should break down into glucose and galactose if there is any enzyme deficiency in the pathway of this this results in the abnormal accumulation of this uh, intermediate metabolites or the glucose is actually not formed so when the galactokinase is deficient so which is the galk deficiency which is the type 2 so the main classical galactosemia involves the deficiency of the enzyme gal which is required for the conversion of galactose 1 phosphate to glucose 1 phosphate the other way other enzyme deficiency is the gale deficiency which is the epimerase deficiency where the glucose cannot be converted into galactose so galt gal can also gale type 1 is the most common where there is a complete absence of galt type 2 disease there is uh, minimal levels of galt with the deficiency of galk uh, enzyme kinase enzyme type 3 is the deficiency of the epimerase enzyme so the type 2 and type 3 are called as clinical variant galactosemia whereas the type 1 is called as the classical galactosemia so the features of uh, galactosemia usually uh, starts after the first week of life child will be presenting with jaundice failure to thrive hepatomegaly feeding problems hypotonia etc so they can be hepatic damage because of the abnormal galactose metabolites like the galactitol and also galactonate that is getting deposited baby presents with jaundice uh, initially indirect progressing towards the direct cholestasis and uh, 10% will progress to sepsis because of e coli which is because of inhibition of neutrophil chem uh, chemiluminescence renal dysfunction encephalopathy so mri changes can be there so galk deficiency predominantly presents with the toxic accumulation of galactitol so which is responsible for the cataract in the eye it also results in cerebral edema so gale deficiency mimics the classical in the varying uh, disorder varying uh, severity so the diagnosis of uh, galactosemia is based upon the screening test so initially we get a newborn screening examination so many centers do only the total galactose levels which is the metabolite or we can also get the enzyme levels of the galt so some centers also do a combination of galactose and also the uh, galt enzyme levels so significant levels is greater than 14.5 we should get a non glucose reducing substances in the urine so classical type the enzyme levels is less than 1% in the clinical variant the enzyme levels are present but only around 1 to 10% so in these cases we need to test for the gale and also the galk enzyme so early diagnosis is required to reduce the mortality but it does not uh, reduce the long term neurodevelopmental outcome or the female reproductive complications so long term complications will include the cns defects like intellectual impairment verbal dyspraxia language uh, developmental delay psychiatric and neuro behavioral disorders primary ovarian insufficiency absent or delayed puberty in males it is not associated with gonadal dysfunction so even we start uh, with the galactose free diet the uh, ovarian complications in the female or the cns cognitive defects are usually unaltered so management so we try to reduce the substrate Uh, by uh, decreasing the amount of the by uh, giving the lactose free diet which is usually a soy based formula or an amino based formula so we can uh, increase the enzyme activity by the uh, advanced techniques like the mrna vrna therapy and finally the ultimatum was the liver transplant see deficient uh, metabolites we can provide by giving the calcium and also vitamin d supplementation so decreasing substrate by lactose free diet so what deficient metabolite by uh, supplementing vitamin d and also calcium so the management for this child that we had to do is cessation of immediate cessation of breast feeding so we started on lactose free diets like uh, the soy based formula or uh, the amino acid based formula so the weight gain was monitored we replaced the fat soluble vitamins uh, were replaced vitamin a d e k calcium and uh, were added the liver functions were monitored so once the baby was started on the lactose uh, free diet the sensorium of the baby improved the baby had weight gain uh the hepatomegaly started uh, regressing in the baby so we did a repeat ultrasound again so which was showing the resolution of the diffuse cerebral edema the electrolyte the sodium levels which was initially 125 rose up to till about 136 the baby is on regular follow up us with us uh, uh, uh tolerating feeds well 
gaining weight and with good activity. So you can stop sharing, Dr. Anirudh, the uh, presentation so that we can go for any discussion. So the case is uh, the case identified, diagnosed, and managed well. But uh, do you think some of the uh, early markers, early clues, uh, could have been picked the baby a little early if we will uh, we would have searched for the baby earlier before presentation? Uh, since the baby presented late to us, sir, like baby presented on no, 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 not this case, not this case. I'm telling any case. What are the better things can be done, doctors? I'll ask Doctor Sarah's inputs also. But uh, before that, just I'm asking this case diagnosed in third week or something and symptomatic. So some of the clues do we uh, got the opportunity to do in many times to, we'll get an opportunity to screen early. So what are the things we could do better so that we won't see a third week. Uh, uh, sick baby or presentation babies in this current era, current scenario, all the metabolic uh, specialists or genetic specialists will ask a simple thing. Probably, as a neonatologist, we can ask to the um, uh, screening, uh, new newborn uh, metabolic First screening, screening or I am screening at day three to day five of life. No, yes, so if yes, you would have done that, so any any hospital, if a baby born in hospital, we encourage the I am screening or newborn metabolic screening probably could have been picked before symptomatic the baby. Yes. That's yes. one of the clue. Then that's one one thing is a desirable. It is required. But many of the places in India is not available. That's a limitation. But if you will ask me as a clinician, that's desirable. That's if we get, uh, get the test done by third day and we are getting the investigation reports positive for a disease, nothing more than that. Because already the baby got disease, but we could do the best by diagnosing early. By So universal neonatal screening should be our goal not only thyroid screening, but this metabolic screening also should be part of the neonatal screening. That's my point. My message here, if we did not do screening, so we struggle with the symptomatic sick babies. We yes. screen and early identification can be goal. Then here, this baby, another very good clue. One of the trainees, uh, probably trainees or fellows, I don't know exactly, but uh, the, highlighted by Dr. Harsabardhan. I like that. That's our goal. We, we taught many of the clinical classes, we, we always teach postnatal word after stabilization, clinical stabilization, don't forget to examine the eye. As per the government program now, universal eye screening, it is not premature ROP screening. It is just an eye check. It is a red reflex check of the baby, specific response of the baby to the visual stimulus. If few things we can do, few disease we can identify, close, we can get it. So this baby, we got cataract in third week. Do you think this cataract developed on third week or it's a congenital cataract? It have been earlier, sir. And it was missed. Oh, there must be. So day one must be the cataract there. So if just putting the torch light or the ophthalmoscope light or autoscope light, any way you can screen. Many of the ways that we can screen, autoscope or ophthalmoscope uh, lights, if we do and screen the red reflex, could have been probably diagnosed early. If the day one, we born in hospital, day one after 24 hours stability, we do a red reflex check. In that, the cataracts can be probably given a good clue. So yes. that's probably the early. I'm talking about the early things. What where the opportunity comes, if you miss it, it can be a symptomatic. Not this baby, universal. On many of the babies, when I finding there of a torch syndrome or retina problem, we can probably glaucoma, concern glaucoma. We can just those are emergency situations. We can diagnose just seeing the red reflex probably. We should not miss it as a clinician. That's yes. the message from this case. Two important things: not to miss metabolic screening, not to miss a simple eye test. And if we do the Metabolic, I don't know the metabolic will come or not, but a hepatomegaly baby, uh, it comes as a red flag for many of the inborn error of metabolism. If a simple urine test, I'm asking reducing sugar, because normally conventionally CUE, they do glucose oxidase test. In the yes. glucose oxidase test, you won't get the non-glucose reducing substance. Asking simple glucose reducing substance, which is a simple Benedict test. So they can boil the urine with Benedict agent and a reducing substance can be reported. It can give us a clue to galactosemia, fructosemia, tyrosinemia. In many of the disease, some of the reducing substance can give an early alert because the urinary organic acids, TMS test and genetic test, those are next steps definitely, but we'll wait for the report. But within bedside, a bedside if a suspicion, we can take the urine, do a reducing substance test. Sometimes it can give us a clue. So like this, few simple things, the many baby taught us actually a few simple things we can plan so early diagnosis can be possible but definitely the definitive diagnosis prognostication treatment is the goal so the way you 
evaluated your team evaluated completely that's a desirable that should be done only but these are the few things probably i want to highlight any of the im approach these few things we can do so with this i will invite now dr sara she was listening i was hoping that in between also few of the approach time to get some questions but probably madam will ask now few of the questions which we can do what way we should proceed how to approach how to go ahead uh, hello good evening sir good evening on alivya khan sir for giving me this opportunity to be part of the nnf teaching uh, am i audible yes, yeah yeah clearly audible yeah Clear. yeah so this was a great presentation thank you so just a couple of questions so when you were telling me about the the uh, investigations part okay so since sir has already go gone to the history and examination differentials i'm coming to the investigation differentials so you said that there was increased lactate metabolic acidosis and hepatomegaly right yes, and also there was an increase in ammonia so uh, we know that this is galactosemia right but this looking at this particular picture of metabolic acidosis with increased ammonia with increased lactate what is what are the other differentials that will come to your mind with these labs apart from galactosemia uh we can also suspect uh this is a very common uh, scenario where we see metabolic acidosis isn't it like part of inborn errors of metabolism so when we see metabolic acidosis with increased lactate and increased ammonia again fatty then the differential narrows down fatty acid oxidation defects right and what what are the differentiating features from fatty acid oxidation defects in this case uh -huh. so in fatty acid oxidation defects i don't think we see this early on such severe cholestasis although it was there in your differential uh, list we don't see this significant cholestasis so that is what differentiates what other differential would you think of we have an increased lactate also over here lactate and low sugars so see when we see low sugars with metabolic acidosis and increased lactate gsd is one more differential but the point against gsd over here is i think the age of presentation okay and cholestasis we don't see cholestasis in gsd right and what other uh, uh, what other just for learning purpose i'm asking so that we know you know like when we see this picture what other metabolic we can think of it was there in your differential list what i'm asking you tyrosinemia mom yeah tyrosinemia so tyrosinemia what is the differentiating from galactosemia in tyrosinemia we see cholestasis but we don't see low sugars metabolic acidosis increased lactate we don't see all of those we see purely a hepatocellular uh, dysfunction with cholestasis okay and one more thing is the fructose intolerance and the fructose 16 bisphosphate deficiencies so they also can have a similar picture where you have hypoglycemia you will have uh, this increased lactate metabolic acidosis uh and uh, like sir said that you know urine reducing re reducing substances is the differentiating test to do but since probably you have done the benedict's test we were not able to pick it up but for fructose pathway and galactose pathway urine reducing substances by the glucose oxidase test will be positive so that will differentiate from the other uh, metabolic uh, conditions and one more metabolic the neiman pick type c can present very early on like a prolonged jaundice but they will not have the metabolic acidosis and all that but they will have similar features that you have mentioned that is the lethargy hypotonia floppy baby with uh, persistent cholestasis so what is differentiating over there from name and pick and this case we don't see hypoglycemia we don't see increased ammonia okay so those are differentiating so from the labs this is how we differentiate am i audible yes ma'am audible yeah yeah, yeah. so from the labs this is how we will differentiate from the uh, metabolic then like sir said newborn screening is the most important to uh, prevent such debilitating forces for the baby and so i want to ask you a little bit what is the uh, uh, biochemical parameter that we are testing on the newborn screening so in our uh, institute we do practice this total galactose mama uh, metabolic Correct. screening what we, we are doing the same things we do total right. galactose so routinely for all the newborn screening all the labs are doing only total galactose uh, nobody does uh, galactose 1 phosphate unless we specifically specify it so usually when we see a total galactose increase 
So the steps like you mentioned, it is need not, it need not be always galactosemia. This I'm talking about a well baby. Obviously, what you presented, it was in a sick baby. But in a well baby, when you see increased total galactose, we have to start on lactose-free diet immediately without waiting for the confirmatory test. But at the same time, we have to send the confirmatory test. Now, what are the confirmatory tests? We have the enzyme assay, that is the galactose 1-phosphate uridyl transferase and the galactose 1-phosphate along with the total galactose. So when we do these three, then we get to know whether it is the classical or whether okay. it is the gale or whether it is the galc. Okay, now why this is important is because the prognosis for each is very different. And one more which you had uh, missed in your presentation is the GALM, G-A-L-M. Okay, that is the galacto galactose mutase enzyme. So that is also the fourth gene which is there, which will help in the differentiation. So if you have a low uh, galactose 1-phosphate, then you will uh, think about GALC. That is a kinase deficiency, right? But yes. the G-A-L-E and the G-A-L-M will both have a high galactose 1-phosphate. So then the enzyme that we are testing is only GALPUT, but GAL, mutase and uh, uh, kinase. Most labs are not uh, testing this. We will need to go for the uh, genetic testing by NGS to see exactly what it is. And one more thing is that you uh, why it becomes important, like even if you have a high galactose one phosphate, right? Can it be possible that this child may have a normal, uh, normal life without the need of a restricted diet? Is that possible? Uh, there is something called as dual variant of galactosemia, mom. Correct. Right. Very good. Dewart variant. So that we initially, when we actually follow this galactose free diet, uh, so uh, so that is a transient condition. So child uh, can lead a normal life, mom, in later parts. Right. So this is why, again, over here, one more, uh, when we see a completely typical picture in a well child, wherein you have high total galactose, high galactose 1-phosphate, low enzyme levels, why it becomes important to do the mutation testing is because if you get this Duart variant, then yes. you can say safely say that this child is going to have a normal, uh, you know, good prognosis without the need of a lactose-restricted diet. So this is yes. what we call as a biochemical type of galactosemia, wherein no diet is required. So it, you know, it elevates all the uh, stress of the family and, uh, uh, you know, the need of, uh, we, we can give a proper counseling based upon this. So that is one thing. And the GALK variant that you mentioned, so those yes. also don't lead into go for the severe hepatocellular types. They will have only the cataract, which has to be monitored. Yes, ma'am. And also about uh, one important point, see, usually when galactosemia, children get... Uh, affected with galactosemia, parents usually ask questions leading to adulthood. Although you are diagnosing them in newborn, they will ask questions leading to adulthood. So some of the, and those questions have to be answered by us pediatricians only because, uh, you know, Harrison textbook doesn't have metabolic diseases in their uh, textbook. So we have to answer it. So some of the key challenges that they face as they grow are hearing, def uh, hearing difficulties. So Bera has to be done. Uh, frequently and also DEXA scanning has to be offered because they have they uh, tend to have uh, low bone mineral den density starting from six years of age five to six years of age and also puberty issues wherein they can have delayed puberty as well as for females this is one of the uh, causes for premature ovarian insufficiency so uh, so they can come with infertility issues okay so uh, these all uh, have to be explained or kept in mind for the surveillance and the need of the diet also has to be explained so that they know that this is important to follow the diet instead of getting lax with the diet. And one more thing is that galactose is also produced endogenously in the body. So although you're following the diet, these children may still continue to have developmental delay, speech delay. So although they are on the diet and doing well without any cholestasis or liver failure, it is very important that they follow up with a developmental pediatrician for the correct management of the intervention therapies for them in, in the future. So these are some very uh, characteristic points because we usually tend to focus on the cholestasis and the failure to thrive. And once we see them thriving well and the jaundice coming down, then I think the other things are neglected. So which is why I'm highlighting these points.
what is the sepsis that is commonly seen infection commonly seen in galactose e. e. coli sepsis no right right and what is the diet lactose free diet so we either give soy based or amino acid uh, based diet mom all right and so in a child uh, after infancy what is the diet advice that you will give because it's predominantly not milk anymore right yes mom what is the diet advice that you will give mm. so the other uh, uh, diets which actually yield uh, this galactose should be avoided mom so we uh, same uh, thing same thing we will say all the lactose free has to be avoided so basically this will include curd curd cheese, milk products dairy products milk, should be avoided yeah all dairy products we will say no butter no ghee so these also have to be avoided and yeah. so the was parents usually ask what are the substitutes that you can give so what will you advise in place of milk as you mentioned soy based amino based or even like uh, you know nowadays we get all these almond almond milk uh, cashew milk all those also can be given to these children okay and um, so where else do you see neonatal cataract with in a floppy baby allergy syndrome we see a posterior embryo toxin and allergy syndrome correct uh, so uh, see cataract in uh, some of the genetic causes in a floppy baby is uh, merenesco jogren syndrome they will be very floppy and have cataract and uh, some of the peroxisomal uh, disorders as well were in floppy baby with cataract so i know this is not related to this but i just thought i'll highlight it over here so i think uh, uh, good good presentation uh, sir anything from your side no that's a very very i i enjoyed the discussion because uh, some of the aspects of metabolic i am and like specialist like you can highlight probably so that's a learning for all the trainees i hope so this uh, by appreciate anirudh because he presented well the case may be team yes, yes. of medical hospital team they evaluated the case the baby came to the way the baby came is a sick baby but they got evaluated diagnosed and stabilized the baby though i congratulate the team there but anirudh answered very well actually i i saw a few of the your questions he was well read yes, yes, well very so good he was answer. answering well so that's the way the students learning i hope with the presentation maybe anything but we to keep my open our my uh, always keep our mind open to for the differentials because this case also when the ammonia somebody is interested to evaluate the ammonia algorithm will be compl completely misled and reach somewhere else so i i always suggest it's a totality after taking into clinical consideration and the biomechanical markers at least two consecutive time repeat it because the ammonia one time you got high you next time you go, go ammonia is low maybe you will think this is not ammonia pathway because if the ammonia pathway ammonia lactic acid acidosis pathway completely i am going towards other uh, instead of uh, the galactosemia i am reaching towards the fatty acid oxidation mitochondrial organic acidemia and urea cycle defects so i am lead lead lead, uh, lead leading my differential diagnosis there so i will suggest if single diagnosis of a single biochemical parameter if abnormal please repeat and review and if it is a increase in trend or decrease in trend that gives you a diagnosis clue and second i i want to highlight again previously also discussion in im case discussion we say the galac g a l a k galac so five parameters at least ask the basic approach how it goes because we discussed previously i won't go to detail but we discussed that how to normally any of the biochemical parameter when you are approaching how will continue this five parameters you ask at least and depending on the trend you can see that okay depending on the trend how to proceed with galactmins already we spoke many times just i will the parameters i will say the glucose we do normally we abg we do all the babies evaluation time lactate ammonia and ketone these three thing you ask additional probably majority of im you can reach in the pathway this five combination of five parameters and few of the odd or few of the rare diseases that may not fit into this five criteria questions so that time you have to uh, follow the different algorithm and differential diagnosis because babies they won't come with diagnosis the dr anirudh and their team did a good good evaluation work so that we got a diagnosis for our learning but babies never came with a diagnosis to us so we combine all clinical picture 
sign and symptoms, basic evolutions, and then further when the metabolic screening will come, it will it will aid it will help in our diagnosis. So with this, probably I will thank Dr. Sara for give uh, her inputs, expert inputs on this metabolic call approach thank to you, metabolic sir. Thank you. and challenge management specifically tips about managing and prognostication. And thanks uh, Mayata team, Dr. Anirudh and Dr. Lakshmi, who is the HOD of the Neonatalist Department of Mayata. She could not join today with us, but she probably with short time interval uh, not notifications, she agreed that they will present a good case and the case presentation. And it was a learning for all of us. Thanking all of you. I'm closing today's session. We'll see next week on Thursday, not on Friday. Next week, Thursday, we'll come for a Noel presentation again. Thank you all. Good night. You. We'll see you again. Thank you, sir. Good night. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. So thank you so much, everyone, for extending us the opportunity to host this session. So with all your permission, I would like to conclude this session over here and looking forward to host your welcome. Thank you so much, everyone, and good night.